Oh, I'm on a stage. <laughs> wow. I haven't done this since drama, sc uh, drama in high school. Anyway, as she said, my name is Jared Seberg. I am an employee of the Department of Motor Vehicles, and I have been authorized to speak on the behalf of the department for uh, the changes that are coming and have already started regarding the Real ID version of our driver's license or identification card. Basically, what is Real ID? This is boring, and I'm going to read it almost verbatim. Basically, the Real ID Act of 2005 sets minimum security standards that the states have to meet in order for us to be able to allow you, as our resident, to use that driver's license or identification card to cross security checkpoints at airports, enter federally secure buildings, or enter military compounds if you're like a contractor and have to work there. Okay. My goal today is to ensure that you understand what Real ID is and is not, help you make a decision on whether or not you need to get Real ID, and hold on one second, please. Yes, I may. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, this was one I scheduled on my own. You know, it was scheduled through a senior, and he's an adjunct professor here. So it got scheduled. Okay, I'll have them contact you. They won't do anything until they contact you. Okay. No, it's American River College. This is their, their lunch hour presentations. Yeah. No, I'm just doing real ID today. It's all, uh, it's all students. Yeah, I will. I will. OK. Okay, not a problem. I'll get, I'll get you contact information and everything after I'm done, and I'll call you back. Okay? Fifth, yeah. Yep. Okay, sounds good. Uh huh, but anyway, back to what we were, right? So, what Real ID is and isn't, whether or not you need to acquire a Real ID, and if you choose to get a real ID version of our driver's license, making sure that you have the proper documents before you come to us to acquire the real ID version of our driver's license. Right, so what does that mean for us? We now issue two different versions of our driver's license. One is federally compliant. That means you've brought everything to us. We've reviewed it and we've issued. It'll have a bear and a star up in the upper right hand corner. If you choose that you don't need a uh, driver's license to do any of those items, it will be marked as federally non-compliant. It will say federal limits apply. Both licenses still work as a driver's license. You're still allowed to drive with both in all 50 states. The only difference is one allows you to cross and is federally approved for crossing checkpoints at airports, military compounds, and federally secure buildings, right? So think about this. These are the questions we ask you to think about. Are you going to be flying within the U.S. here soon? Remember, this, this requirement begins October 1st, 2020, this year. Are you going to have access to secure federal buildings? Or do you need access to secure federal buildings? Or are you going to be entering military bases? If you answer yes to any of these, you probably want to apply for a real ID version of our driver's license or ID card. If your answer is no, or if you have another acceptable document, such as a passport, passport card, or anything else that's approved by the federal government, you may want to wait until your license expires beyond the October 1st, 2020 date. But for these three items, it's either a real ID version of our driver's license or some other federally approved document, right? So what does it mean for you to us to come in and get a federally ver compliant version of the driver's license or ID card? means you've got to visit a DMV field office. That means you have to come in and physically see us. We know everybody hates the DMV. We get it, okay? We get it, right? So we are trying to make this, we have put in a lot of changes in innovation and in making this process a little bit simpler. But what it is is you have to provide specific documentation to us. And what we're asking for is if, if you actually do 
yeah. do need to um, go in. We ask that you fill in the online application before you come in and see us, right? The application can be found on our website. It takes about six minutes to go through the entire process of filling it out. But that's six minutes of pain and suffering that you don't have to go through with the DMV, okay? And the good thing about that application is if you go home and fill it out today, it's good until March 4th of 2021. That application stays valid for 12 months and it's in our system. The only thing we ask you to do is at the end of that application, it gives you an eight digit code. And what that allows you to do is take that code in, so snap a photo of it, write it down, do something with it. You take that in and that gives you absolute information, uh, gives us your information right away. <coughs> okay. This next part of it, it's called, I call it three steps, four documents, right? We have to prove your identity. So we need to see one document that'll prove your identity and date of birth. We need to see one proof of your social security number, usually your social security card. And we now need to see two proofs of where you live for students in here. Okay, I'm going to show you multiple ways to get this done. You may not have bills or anything else like that, but there are ways for us to get you verified on residency without having some of the documents we mentioned. Okay, so identity, we need to know who you are and who you say you are. Okay, so the most common, these are the most common things that we see and these are the most common things that are approved. So U.S. passport has to be valid. The passport card, same thing, has to be valid. Certified copy of the U.S. birth certificate. I'm gonna show you examples of good, good ones and bad ones here in a minute. If you've naturalized or became a citizen here in the United States, we'll take your, your certificate of naturalization or citizenship. If you are still in the process and you're just a naturalized resident, we'll take your permanent resident card. Or if you've just entered in, in, into the state, into the United States, if you have a valid forward passport with correct US visa and valid entry documents, the approved I-94 form, we can use that as well, right? These are not good birth certificates, okay? The ones with the feet on them, the one that has a little ducky and a rattle on it, these aren't good birth certificates. These are ones issued as a certificate from the hospital that you were born at, and these are not valid birth certificates, okay? Ones we are looking for have been issued by the state or the county you, res you were born in. These have an official stamp or seal. They are typically maybe signed in different colors. Uh, they cannot be laminated in any way. Abbreviated, what we mean is a shortened version of the birth certificate. So instead of getting what this blue one looks like, you get about half of that, that's an abbreviated. Or an abstract, an abstract birth certificate is even smaller, okay? If you were born prior to about 1983, this is what your birth certificate would look like from the county or the state. It's on typically a kind of brown tannish paper and it will have everything. After about that, the states have slowly moved and we all are now on this, secured for, uh, this secure paper, this blue paper. Uh, it has multiple different security uh, features built into it. And the biggest prominent one is that if we photocopy it and if it should come out saying void, right? That's the biggest security feature on it. But that's what California uses now for birth certificates. It's an official document. This is what we're looking for for your birth certificate. Okay. Whoops, went one too far. If you've changed your name along the way, right? I went too, too far. If you've changed your name along the way, you have to prove that as well. Okay. So when you were, when you were born, if you've changed your name along the way, whether it be through adoption and you took your adoptive parents' names, if you've gotten married and took uh, your spouse's last name, if you entered it into a domestic partnership and, got, and took your domestic partner's last name, we need to see those documents. Also, if your name changed back to what it originally was, we need to see that dissolution of either the marriage or the uh, domestic partnership as well. If you have been married, if you've gone through multiple name changes, we need to see the entire chain of events. So if you've been married, divorced, married, divorced, we need to see the entire chain of events. You have to bring in all of those certified documents. Okay. Social security is fairly straightforward. It can be your social security card. That's the most common one that we see. If you don't have that and if you have a job, you can bring in your current W-2, your end of year statement. That's very popular right now because everybody just got their W-2s that are working because they're filing tax returns. 
If you are working, you can bring in a copy of your pay, uh, a certified copy of your pay stub, your original pay stub. They're currently asking to make sure that your pay stub is within the past 60 days. Okay. If you don't have either of any of those, if you are drawing Social Security, that's what the SSA 1099 form is. You can bring that in. That's your end of year statement for a Social Security. The non-SSA 1099 form is for those that are on disability through Social Security. If you're on disability through Social Security, that's also the same form um, that'll have your Social Security number. For the W-2 and the pay stub, please make sure that all nine digits of your Social Security number are present. A lot of um, corporations and companies have started to mask the Social Security number. Um, the state of California masks mine down to the last two digits, right? It's just random letters before that. So if it doesn't have all nine digits, we can't use it. So please make sure that your W-2 or your pay stub has all nine digits of the Social Security number. Proof of residency. This is probably the easiest thing that we can do and we can prove, right? We can literally take anything on this list, a rental or a lease agreement. If you own a house, your mortgage agreement, any home utility bill, that includes your cell phone bill, right? School, school records, school transcripts work, medical bills, employment or insurance documents that have your name and your address on it as well. If you own a vehicle or if you have a vehicle in your name, your California vehicle title or registration work as well. You've got to drive to see us anyway, so that's one right there. Or any bank or credit card statement you may have, okay? Any of these work. It can be a paper copy of a paper copy. We don't care. It just can't be electronic. We can't do the electronic because we have to scan these documents into our system, so we need a paper copy. For those of you that may not have two forms of residency, what we can do when you bring in your identifying document, it'll have it, it, your parents or a legal guardian. If you can prove them to you, we can tie your address to them, right? We can tie your address to their address. So that's another way we can do it. If you don't have any bills, get mom or dad to give you one of their bills. I'd actually tell my son to pay my bill too, but hey, that's beside the point. But make sure that the names match on the document that we're trying to tie it to, and then we're good. We can tie it to uh, parents and legal guardians, okay? For a complete list of documents that we will accept, like I said, these are the very most common, most basic, easiest ones that we have seen. There's a complete list at our Real ID website, realid.dmv.ca.gov. This also has a real cool interactive checklist that allows you to go through and say, I have this, 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 and this, right? All of this I have ready to go for the DMV. You can check it, print it out, and it'll be ready to go. And when you go into DMV, you just take a look at your checklist. Yes, I've got everything. You're ready to go, right? So once again, I know everybody hates the DMV, but you got to visit a DMV field office for us to do this. We are in the process. We're field testing a couple sites that allow us to have you scan your documents at home and we store them until you get to the office. You still have to bring those documents with you, but it takes less time because we don't have to scan them anymore. We just verify them real fast. Again, we're, we're asking you to provide specific documentation that the federal government has told us we have to take and only this is what we can take for these steps. Okay? And then, of course, if you can, fill out the application online before you come in. That saves about six minutes at the office. No problems, no hassle. Less time seeing us. We're all happy, right? Anyway, oh, they didn't warn you there's a quiz. This is college, there's always a quiz, right? Even with every presenter. If you get your renewal notice and it says, congratulations, you can renew by mail or over our internet site, can you apply for a real ID version of our driver's license or identification card this way? Anybody? No, exactly, yeah, no, right? No, you have to apply in person in the DMV field office. The process is, as, as far as we know, it is a one-time only event. So the first time you do this and process and become real ID compliant, from there on out, your license, uh, your renewal ability will go back to renew by mail or renew on the internet. Okay, this is only a one-time event, as far as we know at this point. Okay, again, remember to use our, real, uh, our convenient ID checklist on realid.dmv.ca.gov. With that in mind, we do have Saturday offices now. There are 60 different field offices in California that offer Saturday, office, uh, Saturday hours. 
The two, in, the two biggest in the Sacramento region are Sacramento on Broadway um, by UC Davis Medical Center and Roseville. These are the two Saturday offices, right? Extended morning hours, kind of flip-flop. Uh, Rockland is an extended morning hour. They're open from seven to five on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. And then I wanna say South Sacramento is the other one that's seven to five, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. With the Saturday off office hours, they are fully staffed. They're open eight to five. And what we have found out is if you go in the office on a Saturday afternoon after about one o'clock, there's hardly anybody in there. You get in and out in about 20 minutes, about the same time as it takes to make an appointment right now, or once you have an appointment to get through our lines, right? The extended morning hours, that first hour from seven to eight is used exclusively for non-appointments and they make, uh, they. Uh, try to work as many people through that don't have an appointment as possible. Okay, so these are a couple other options because with our appointment system, with the Real ID Act in place now, our appointments are very scarce. We're allowed to book, we allow you to make an appointment 90 days in advance, and right now we are at that 90 day window at almost every DMV field office that you go to, right? So, with that, if you make an appointment and you get an appointment in and you get it changed over, takes about 20 minutes from the time you come in to the time you complete. Current statewide averages, I just took a quick look before I came in here, it, we're still averaging close to about an hour and 15 with a non-appointment. So if you don't have an appointment, it's not as bad as it was a couple years ago, but it still takes a lot longer than, uh, than with, with an appointment. <coughs> so we encourage, but say it's not necessary to make an appointment if you can. But again, Saturday in the afternoon is an option at any of our Saturday offices. And then, like I said, that 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock in the morning service is exclusively for non-appointments. And I've taken a look at the numbers, and most offices, the larger offices like, uh, like South Sac, can get two to 300 people through in that first hour. <clears throat> so they're doing real good with that. Whoops, where did I go? Okay. <clears throat> now, just because you have to do real ID at our field office doesn't mean you have to do anything else at our field office. For those of you that are older and own cars, or if you own your own car, we will gladly take your money through the internet or in the mail and give you a nice one inch sticker valid for the next year, okay? <clears throat> you can still do every, almost everything. Renew your registration online, change your address online, let us know that you sold the vehicle online, right? All of that can be done online or through the mail, right? We also have self-service kiosks, right? Here in the Sacramento area, we have one at the Safeway, uh, down 19th Street when it turns into whatever street that becomes. We also have one at the main campus of the Sacramento Library, and we have one at each of the field offices here. These kiosks allow, to go, allow you to go up to it, no appointment. You pay your registration. They're now doing printouts. I think they're starting printouts this year. License Driver license and registration printouts. And we have moved on beyond English and Spanish. By July, it's supposed to be able to do the same amount of languages as our terminals do, touch, uh, touch screen testing terminals. So it'll be able to do 32 languages, right? They're expanding the language component of it as well. But these allow you to, without an appointment and offsite, we started with 176 of these. By the end of the year, we will have uh, four, over 400. And if your registration expires in the middle of the summer, just come by the state fair, come by the DMV booth at the state fair. We have one of these up and all the time. I run the booth in the mornings every Friday that the fair is open. And so I'll be more than willing to show you how to demonstrate and use the kiosk if you have any questions. All right, let's talk about it. This is the DMV Speakers Bureau. Uh, that's what I'm part of as well um, through Office of Public Affairs. What this does is if you have a group, we ask for larger than 40 typically Give them a, a shout out at the website DMV Speakers Bureau at dmv.ca.gov. They will assign one of us to come out to your presentation and do your presentation on Real ID if you think this is valuable enough to have people come out and talk about it. Okay? Remember, this is coming October 1st, 2020. We have not been given any official uh, news on any extensions. As far as we know, this is the drop dead deadline for Real ID to begin being necessary at airports, fe uh, secure federal buildings, and military compounds. And with that, I will open it up to any questions if there are any. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, passport yes, passport. So the passport, the passport card, 
those are already federally approved documents, right? And you still need your passport for international travel. The real ID compliant version of our driver's license does not eliminate the need for passport for international travel. So if you have a passport, if you have a passport card and your license expires beyond that 2020 date and, you, and your passport is valid, we kind of ask you to kind of think about whether or not you need to come in at this point and do it or not, maybe not wait until your renewal, right? So if you have an other form of federally approved document that's on the Department of Homeland uh, website, you may not need it. Also, if you're a member of Global Entry, Fast Pass, Fast Track, or anything else that TSA has set up to allow you to avoid, basically you go through TSA PreCheck. If you're a member of those, we know those are also federally approved and accepted, so you may not necessarily need a real ID version compliant, or federally compliant version of our driver's license or ID card. Any other questions? No? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for letting me have, and come out here and present on this. If you have any further questions, uh, a couple people in here have my contact information. Oh yes, and I do have handouts top and bottom. These basically go over everything I talked about. It gives you a much more comprehensive list of acceptable documents for each step of the process. And it also gives you a couple things to think about about whether you want the federally compliant driver's license or not. Again, I thank you for your time. Yes, I Mr. Have Hartley. A question. Um, if you go in there and you're prepared, except as it turns out, you don't have one of the pieces of paper that you need, but everything else is okay, then what happens? Uh, it depends on what, where we're at in the process, right? Um, and that's also an issue that I'm trying to resolve with field office because I've heard stories of people being able to come back and finish the process. And I've also heard stories of them closing out the application and saying they have to come back. Okay, so that's an in, internal thing that we have to figure out what's going, what the actual process is going to be that if you thought you were prepared and you came in, you were missing one, one of the key components, what are we going to do, right? So that's something internally we have to discuss. So I can't give you a solid answer on that yet. Yes, if you follow these steps, if you fill out the online application, if you go through it with a fine tooth comb and get the documents we need, you're fine. You will go in there and you'll be in and out and it'll be federally compliant by the time you leave. We won't be able to issue it to you, you still get it in the mail, but you will be federally compliant. Any other questions? That was my, that was my question. When does it so once you, once you complete the documentation part, once we are done and we have finalized that license, it's noted in our system that you are federally compliant. But then you won't get the federally compliant version of it until it comes in the mail. And that's still averaging 10 to 14 days after you complete the process. It still takes 10 to 14 days to get the license. Yeah, proof of residency, not two-part registration. If there are two different cards, why not? <laughs> we just want two different documents. And we, can, and we know what the plate numbers are. Any two different documents from any one of those categories we can take. Yes, sir. Same cost as it would be. That's why we ask people to wait till they renew, if possible. Uh, renewal this year is $37, and we're not adding any fee for any additional thing. If you need to get it between renewal cycles, it's $27 for a duplicate, but there are no added associated costs for making your uh, driver's license federally compliant versus not federally compliant. Okay? Okay. You all have a wonderful rest of your day, and thank you for letting me be here.